Well, it's my honor tonight to uh, introduce our speaker. Um, I call him the Wild Wild West. And uh, if you look at the uh, virtual background, I think you can see why he's earned that nickname. So anyway, I, I've not known Wes really that long in Delinda, maybe three years or so, and uh, some of you have known Wes longer than I've been alive. But uh, anyway, uh, I, I've learned a little bit about his journey, and uh, I'm really thankful for uh, just knowing him and just the encouragement that he is to, uh, you know, to follow the Lord and journey with the Lord. And I was thinking of something a friend of mine from uh, Ginger and I from uh, Florida, uh, Mike Green, uh, shared this quote. He said, a, a student wants to know what his teacher knows, but a disciple wants to be like his teacher. And when I think of Wes, I, I think of the disciple, because I know Wes's heart is to be like the teacher, like the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he certainly has a heart and the compassion to uh, see others uh, come into the kingdom and to really appreciate his heart to uh, in ministry to men and, uh, and his giftings and uh, he's just a, a great new friend and uh, I really cherish him and uh, he, he walks the walk I know that he walks the walk and uh, he act actually changed my uh, stereotype of uh, motorcyclists as well I gotta say that but that's another story and uh, so <laughs> so anyway uh, Wes uh, we're looking forward to what the Lord has put on your heart tonight so go for it all right my friend thank you for the kind words it's uh, <clears throat> humbling and I know most of them are lies but it's okay so <laughs> anyway I wanted to start off by telling you guys that you, you, you know you're all on camera. And I saw something the other day where they, they had this Zoom thing going on. This guy decided he wanted to jump up and go get a drink, and he was in his chonies, and nobody knew it until he got far enough out to see him. See, so uh, just just in case you you know you don't know you're being watched, you're being watched. Um, anyway, I'd also like to uh, uh, thank Larry and Dan. Larry is uh, the Linda's brother, my brother-in-law, but he's also our uh, Northern California coordinator for the Christian Motorcycle Association and Dan you'll see down there in the corner somewhere is my area rep and so I'm really uh, really grateful you guys are on here uh, thank you thank you thank you um, I was kind of uh, tricked into doing this I think um, Delinda says you know I don't consider myself really a public speaker at all and she says well just give your testimony and uh, I think she knew it was going to go maybe a little bit further than that but uh anyway i'm just uh I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to to share a little bit of my life with you and where it's been and um i know a lot of you i have not and do not know you know what my background was where i came from so i am going to do a little bit of that and we'll progress along and uh, hopefully when i get to the end of this somebody will have uh, gleaned something out of this besides uh my, my life but anyway i was born uh 1948, um, Oakdale, California. I got, uh, I've got two brothers. Um, right now, my middle brother and I are the same age. We're both 71. Uh, my youngest brother has passed away. Our birthdays were in April, May, and June. Uh, they used to call us Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego at, at church. We didn't know if that was good or bad. Um, my mom and dad were missionary trainers uh, when we were born. Uh, that was in uh, 19... Well, not when I was born, but 1954, uh, 55, we went to Cuba. Um, we're down there for a year and a half, and then Fidel Castro took over. The thing I do remember about Cuba was uh, it was during the seasons when everything was ripe. Uh, you could go out in the field and pick sugar cane and avocados and bananas, and it was a fun time. Uh, we also had to uh, carry the water. We lived in a thatch house thatch hut, I guess you'd call it. Uh, tarantulas walking across the floor it wasn't uncommon. Uh, had to sleep under nets and stuff. But anyway, that was kind of my, uh, my upbringing. My parents were kind of PKs. And then when we came back, uh, dad actually went into cabinet making. And so we got a, kind of got away from that. Uh, we went to the church in Sacramento where, uh, who had sent mom and dad out. 
Uh, it was a Pentecostal church. This was a wild, crazy, holy roller church. Um, they used to slide us under the pews in the Sunday night service when they got to dancing as kids so we wouldn't get stepped on and stuff. And, uh, so it was, uh, the only bad thing about it is they, they preached the clothesline a lot. They didn't really preach like the grace of God and um, how much God loves you. And what I really remember, uh, this is a horrible thing to tell you, but we moved up to a little town called Plymouth. And a friend of mine came up and I think I was probably in the eighth grade at the time. And he was driving. And anyway, he came up and we were going to go down to um, this place to go swimming. It's called the First Bridge. And uh, we get down there and there's girls down there swimming. Well, I'd never been anywhere that was mixed bathing. We were told that you just could not do that. I mean, you know, you just so anyway, he says, well, let's just go swimming anyway. And I'm nervous as a cat on a hot tin roof. And um, we're swimming and, you know, I'm kind of. I'll be honest with you, gawking around, because I've never seen a girl in a swimming suit before. And back then, they wore a lot more than they wear today. Um, and the airplane flew over. And I looked up this airplane. It was one of them little Piper Cub things. And I told him, I said, that's the pastor. And he says, no, no way. I said, that's the pastor. He's spying on us. we got to get out of here. And so that's kind of the legalistic stuff that, that I grew up with. Um, <laughs> oh, boy. You look back and you wonder how you, how you survived some of that. Some of that stuff amazingly as you guys know it's actually even later in your life i mean it's like it just i don't know kind of taints you and as you go through life you learn a little bit more about what god's really about and it's not not about preaching the clothesline and uh preaching the rules uh we moved to uh, plymouth when i was in the eighth grade as i said um but that was a neat place to live i liked it up there but uh, when we were in Sacramento, that was the first place time I was in a choir, and I was really doing pretty good in church. We got up to Plymouth, and I got into high school, and things kind of went south, as they do for a lot of a lot of people. Um, I wasn't a good student. Uh, my favorite uh, subjects were PE and shop, uh, so I didn't uh, I didn't do well in school. Didn't uh, didn't put much effort into it. I guess is probably the reason why. Um, got into partying, and I'd much rather party than party to study, um, got into liking fast cars. And, uh, so anyway, all of that leads down the, leads down the wrong way. And it was funny. I started drinking so much and there was times I'd come home and I'd think, man, my parents are so dumb. They don't even know this because they'd never say anything to me. Uh, there was times when dad had to stop the car and let me puke because I was sick on the way to church. Um, and never said anything to me. And it was funny when my boys got older and came home and had it, it, it tipped a few and you walked into the bedroom and it was like, whoa, what happened in here? And so I just realized for some reason they never said anything. I don't, I don't know why that was. Um, anyway, in 1967, I went in the Navy. Uh, a friend of mine and I joined on a, what they called the delay program. We, we were going to be, uh, I was already 18 and so I was going to be drafted. And so we were going to join the Marines. And uh, my dad was in the Navy during World War II. And so he convinced us how stupid we were to do that. He said, at least if you go in the Navy, you'll sleep in a bed at night. And so anyway, it was an extra two years to go in the Navy and we really didn't want to do that, but uh, that's what we ended up doing. Uh, it was funny because when I was over there, my youngest brother was also shipped over there and mom raised such a fuss about both of us being in the war zone that they shipped me back home. Uh, and I went on to a, a different ship. Uh, the one thing I can say about the Navy that it did for me, it made me an alcoholic. And, that's uh, got to travel and become an alcoholic. So that, that was a good thing, I guess. It wasn't such a good thing, no. Um, anyway, when I got out of the Navy, I worked for my dad. That was really hard. Um, that's where uh, it was like you could do nothing right with dad. Um, I love my dad with all my heart. Uh, never heard my dad say he loved me, but I, I do love my dad with all my heart. Um, there was one time I can remember specifically the mom walked into the back door of the shop and I could build a drawer every minute, believe it or not. But, and we'd pick them all up and build about 10 drawers. And I'd take them into the back room where we put them into cabinets and dad was just eating on me, just really giving me grief. And uh, anyway, the second time we walked by the door and my mom says, would you like me to give you a break, Edward? And then, so um, it was just kind of a, kind of the way things went. In fact, it was really, really interesting. I'm jumping a little ahead of myself here, but I was telling Jim Gifford some of these stories and Jim has been 
an exceptional mentor to me. Uh, and uh, he told me from that, he says, you know, he says, you got father issues. And I said, no, nah. that was the furthest thing from my mind. Started part of my healing process. Um, you know, it's not that I think any, any less of my dad. I mean, what he did, he did. And like we did as parents, we just did the best we could do. And, you know, it wasn't always right, uh, but we did the best we could do. Um, anyway, we got married in uh, 1973. I married my high school sweetheart, uh, Jennifer, and uh, actually led her to the Lord. <laughs> Amazingly enough, I was still drinking, but it's kind of, you know, she thought I had a pretty good curb on it, so it wasn't a, wasn't a big deal. Um, led her to the Lord. Um, unfortunately, because of the drinking and stuff, I wasn't a good husband. Um, I didn't, I was, I never cheated. I never did anything like that, but I, um, uh, was just not there. That's the way drinkers are. I had a Jeep at the time that I raced, uh, always been kind of a gearhead. And there was times I'd come home and I'd spend a whole paycheck if I lost a, lost a race. And I look back and I don't even know why she stayed with me. It's just, uh, <laughs> it was a crazy time. Um, finally got delivered of drinking. This was one of the highlights, biggest points of my life, and I probably still can't tell you this without tearing a little bit, but um, when I'd come back out of the Navy, uh, there was the pastor's son had been a friend of mine where we'd gone to church. Well, he'd become the pastor while I was gone. And uh, Anyway, we'd do hunting and fishing and stuff together. And really a neat guy, never, never really preached at me or anything. And uh, anyway, Jennifer really wanted me to start going back to church, so I'd go back once in a while and then I got to where I wanted to really wanted to be delivered from drinking because I realized it was such a problem and um, anyway one night uh, one night Dick back then we still had service on Sunday nights anyway he uh, he preached couldn't even tell you what he preached on and uh, he did an altar call and I don't even couldn't tell you to this day how I ended up up there but Ended up up there, and, and he started praying, and prior to this, for months, I had brought in beer and booze, and we'd put it on the altar and prayed down fire from heaven, and so he, 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 knew, he knew where my, my, that was my problem, um, and so anyway, he started praying. At first, I got mad because I thought, he, I thought Jennifer had been talking to him. Uh, he was praying stuff that, that she knew, and then, then he started praying stuff that she didn't know, and it was just... Uh, what a time. Anyway, from that night, that was a Sunday night. And from that time on, I never had a drink. Never even had the desire. Um, I had a place in my life where I wish everybody that I knew that did have that problem could have the same salvation that I had. Um, part of the problem during that whole time was I loved racing that Jeep. and uh, It was, wasn't a month later, probably, and I was up to the altar and I was praying. I said, Lord, if that Jeep's a problem, you send somebody along with a lot of money. And where I worked was 10 miles out of Plymouth. And ten, Plymouth is a town of about uh, 900. And then I worked out of Fiddletown, which is a town of about 100. And I was another three miles past that's so where our shop was. And the next day, a guy came in and said, who owns the Jeep? And I said, I do. And he said, you want to sell it? And I thought, oh, Lord, you wouldn't do this to me. And I said, well, I'll sell it, but it's going to take a lot of money. And I told him what I wanted for it. And he said, that's a lot of money. And I said, it's a lot of Jeep. If you don't want it, that's good for me. And the next day he came back with the money. Uh, don't pray what you don't want to happen. <laughs> anyway, it was a, uh, it was a, it was a good day. It was just one of those big things in my life where God saw that I had another problem, and if you're willing to give it up, He's willing to take it. Uh, just just be willing to let it go. Yeah, uh, that was that was a that was a hard thing. Um, Dick Wood was the, that pastor was also the one that got me into leading worship. Um, there was um, times when I just really wouldn't want to do it. He'd actually call me up in the morning and say, get up, get down here. This is, this is what you're called to do. You just need to do this. And um, if I could ever credit a person for my salvation, it would be Dick Wood. Um, he was just the pastor that, uh, he was a mentor. You know, he was a guy that cared. And it was pretty cool. Um, around that time, I got a brain tumor. Uh, and it, uh, the doctor came out with a pen and he went like this, and he said, you've got a brain tumor right there about the size of a golf ball. 
and I'd been having headaches and all kinds of stuff. So, we, you know, we knew something was wrong. Anyway, I was in the hospital. Um, mom and dad knew people all over the country who were Christians. And obviously they'd call and got everybody praying and stuff. About the third day I was in the hospital, they were going to take me on the fourth day to do the operation. And they came in and I was starting to feel better. And they said, well, we're going to do one more MRI to see if we can see, make sure exactly where it's at and all that. They went to the MRI, it was gone. It just, and they, they couldn't understand. I don't like can understand. You know, it's another thing that, another thing that God did. Uh, we moved to Susanville in, in uh, 1982. I left the, left dad, left the shop. Hardest thing I've done in my whole life was to go up and tell dad I was quitting. Um, and he took me back down to the shop, said, you'll never make as much money as in this shop and just gave me grief. Didn't talk to me for three years. Um, it was really, really a hard time. Uh, but leaving a shop was probably the best thing I ever did. And that was just another God thing. Um, a friend of mine, it was a really bad economy during 82. Some of you older guys probably remember that. Um, a friend of mine that worked for the youth authority asked me to go to Oregon with him. And I did. And as we talked on the way home and he says, you know, you really need to get on with the state. And I didn't even know what state jobs were. I didn't have a clue what they were much less a, a vocational instructor. That's what I ended up becoming was a vocational instructor from Mellon cabinet and building trades. And that's what I did. I teach, I taught inmates. And so it was a, uh, it was a really cool job. I really liked it when I started. Um, there was a time when we first moved up there. It took everything Jennifer and I had to get there. Cause like I said, the economy had been bad. And, uh, we spent every dime we had to, to get to Susanville and we're up there and man, it was like, we were turning in Coke bottles that we'd taken with us just to buy bread for the kids and stuff. I went up on the hill behind our house one day and I said, man, God, did you come up here just to kill me? I mean, is this, what's the idea behind this? I mean, I just don't understand. I, you know, I thought we were following what you wanted us to do. And uh, next day I went into work and there was a check there. I had started on August 28th. And so I had to pay for the 28th, 29th and the 30th, which they had not given to me. And I didn't have a clue that I had this coming. And so it was just another way that God reveals himself. Um, and in Susanville, we had a great, it was a great place to live. We hunted, we fished, we just, the boys loved it up there. I liked it up there. We were real involved in our church, uh, kids clubs and everything else. And um, still did worship up there. In 1986, we moved to, uh, I'm only on the second page of 14, guys. So I don't know if you got anything to do tonight, but. <laughs> not real. It's not quite that bad. I'll, what time is it? I'll pick up the pace here. Um, Jennifer wanted to be closer to her mom. And so the doors opened for her and I to be able to move to Sonora. And I went, worked, went to work at the prison in, in Jamestown. Um, and that was only, we were an hour and a half from both her parents and my parents at that point. And in Susanville, we were about five hours. And so it made it a little bit, uh, made, made it a little nicer being a little bit closer to home. Um, life was good. We were actually getting along good. Um, Jennifer had always been a homemaker and the boys were getting old enough now that she wants to start doing something else. So she started going to Bible college. Uh, this girl would learn chapters. She could memorize chapters. I can't hardly memorize a verse. And I was just so impressed. But the other thing I should tell you, strong woman. And I guess God thinks I needed strong women in my life because you know the lady I live with now. You know the strong woman. So, and that's a good thing. God, God gives us what we need. Um, anyway, we uh, were very involved in our church up there again uh, in, in, in Sonora when we moved down there. Uh, one, one little uh, tidbit Jalinda likes for me to tell. Uh, if, you, if, if you've been in church very long, you've probably been hurt. Anyway, we lived across the street from the church and uh, the pastor had left. And so I was what they called the head deacon. And so I was in charge of getting the speakers in and perspective pastors and stuff like that. And anyway, I'd, I'd been out and I was cutting our rose bushes. And I thought, well, I should go across the street to the church and cut theirs. Good. So I went over there and I saw the cars there and I thought, oh yeah, this is whatever morning, Tuesday morning, the old people come in and pray. And I thought, well, that's cool. I'll go in and say hi. And so I went in and I didn't see anybody and I could hear voices in the back room behind the platform. And so I walked up to the door and I heard my name. And I stood there for a few minutes and I learned more about me and my parents and uh, my uh, discrepancies in my life and everything else than I, that, that I didn't even know about. So I opened the door and I says, would any of you guys like for me to clarify this for you? And it was like, if you could have seen the look on their face, it was worth opening the door for. But 
uh, just kind of a crazy time. People just, people <laughs> do crazy things. Um, had two sons, uh, Jeff and Jason. Uh, Jason was a perfect child. He turned 16 and then he turned upside down. Uh, about the same time, Jennifer was diagnosed with breast cancer. Page two of 16. It's yeah. <laughs> um, another hard spot. Um, John 11, four. She was sure she had heard from the Lord. We'd, we'd actually gone down to a doctor to find out what, what we thought we were going to do with this lump that was, she'd found in her breast. And uh, the doctor was very, uh, I can't think of a good word. It just wasn't a good experience. Um, and we went home and, you know, we both started praying. And um, she said, you know, Wes, she says, I just know the Lord's given me this and verse. And I said, you know, if I, if I knew anybody could hear from the Lord, I knew she could hear from the Lord. Um, and she said, this isn't a sickness unto death, but a sickness unto the glory of God. Uh, three people, different people prophesied that to us before she died in 1997. And um, that, in that particular moment, I actually thought, this is going you know, to really sound crazy, but I actually thought she'd come back from the dead. I thought, what, are, what better testimony would there be to her sisters and, and everybody around us that, if, you know, if she passed away and the Lord brought her back, I thought this would be so cool. And obviously that didn't happen. Um, I went into a point where it was, uh, I felt like I had to make a conscious decision whether I was going to move forward with the Lord or if I was just going to go back into my old ways. And, um, and what really kept me from going back to my old ways is I didn't really like that guy back there either. Uh, I'd really, really liked who I had become. And the other thing was I didn't want to disrespect what her and I had, had grown with. We'd been married for 24 years when she passed. Anyway, then comes Delinda. <laughs> Smile, girl. <laughs> she told me not to say too much about her. <laughs> um, Anyway, Delinda and San Luis Obispo. Um, we talked on the phone for about six weeks, which was pretty cool. Uh, I got to where I really liked the person I was talking to on the phone. We didn't have a clue what each other even looked like. We'd never seen a picture, uh, nothing. And I decided to come to San Luis Obispo. I'd gone to a car show and her cousin who introduced us and I had gone up to a car show and he was going to see a lady down in Tascadero. So we came down um, actually met six weeks after we had, uh, after we'd been talking on the phone. Um, I was a real smart aleck when I first called her because I called her up, her cousin kept saying, you need to call my cousin in San Luis Obispo. And I really didn't want to. And so I call her up one day and I leave a message on the phone and say, oh, this is Wes. Daryl said I need to call you. <laughs> She'll tell you the story. She went, delete. <laughs> and so anyway, we, uh, I tried that a couple of times, finally hooked up with her. And uh, we talked when the first day we met, she asked me if I had cowboy boots. And I said, well, yeah, I got cowboy boots. And she says, oh, okay. And so she came over to the embassy suites where Daryl and I were staying. And when she opened the door, Daryl and I are standing there in a pair of cutoff jeans and cowboy boots. And so she, she should have known better then than to just bail out on me. But, um, and the, the other thing she told me, she was worried I was bald. Now look at me. I'm getting kind of, but anyway. So we got married in um, 1998. It's been 22 years. Uh, two of the happier years of Delinda's life, I think. But no, we had some really, we had some rocky times. We started. It's anybody that thinks that you just jump off. I was, I was so naive that I thought I'd just jump off into another relationship and life would be good, and we'd just roll on. And uh, boy, it, it's a anyway. It was, it was a hard time. Um, I don't know how people stay married that aren't that don't have the Lord. I, I, I don't get it at all. I mean, my hats off to them if they can. Um, one of the things that really kept us together, kept me with Delinda, because there was a lot of times I thought, I'm out of here. I ain't doing this. Her pastor, uh, Pastor Richie, uh, told me that he said, I've never married anybody that divorced. And I, that really, really set on my heart. And, and Delinda was probably saying, I'm sure there's lots of times that one of us said, yeah, I'm out of here. The other one said, let, it, let me help you pack your bags. But, um, perse perseverance works good. It's uh God's brought us a long ways, brought us, brought me a really long ways and her a little bit. You know, it's been, uh, it's been really good. 
Uh, we know that we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God put us together. Uh, the whole thing was an absolute miracle when I moved down here. Uh, I'll do the, the short version. I, I was coming down and I was helping to London. They were doing a colony days and she called me up and says, can you come down this weekend and help me put up this hooch that they sold hot dogs to because she had a youth center. And I said, sure. And so I came down and I met one of our associate wardens down there. And she said, Wes, what are you doing down here? And I said, oh, I'm dating this deal. And she says, if you ever want to come down, come to Avenal. And I said, eh, no, I ain't coming down here. And I got a reason to go to Avenal. And Monday, I get a call from my boss, and he says, I hear you're going to Avenal. And no, 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 I didn't say I was going to Avenal. Well, anyway, long story short was we decided that we were going to get married, and we decided that I was coming this direction. And so I called Mike up, and within a month, I was in Avenal. And it just doesn't happen in this state. I mean, it was just, it was just an absolute miracle. So when times got tough, we knew that God had put us together, and we are supposed to be that way. Uh, my oldest son, Jason, uh, DL had a big, 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 big part of to play in his life. He, uh, he called, I'd, I just had some surgery and he called and left a message on the phone and let me come in and said, I just got set down. She said, yeah, I can hear that. I don't want to hear this. You know, it's Jason. I don't care. I don't want to hear this. Anyway, he's wanting to come home and he's never wanted to live with me. And he said, it was like uh, living in rehab couple of rules I think you have to go by if you're going to live in my house. That's just kind of how it is. And so um, anyway, he wanted to come down and it was really, for me, it was a really tough decision. And Delinda and I have been praying for him since we had been married and that had been probably four years maybe. Um, and anyway, she was really the encouragement that, that brought him down. I just built a new garage up, up on top. Most of you know where that's at. And, uh, we had to put him up there because him and I are so much alike. It's like, we're just like this and Delinda was continually arbitrating between the two of us to keep us apart. And he'd been here for a week maybe and I told him, I said, you know, you're more than welcome to stay here, but you need to get a job. If you think I'm going to get up and go to work every day and you sit here on your tail, that doesn't work for me. Uh, and so he had been here about a week and he decided he wanted to bring his girlfriend down and I said, mm, well, she can come down and she'll stay in the spare bedroom in our house. And he didn't like that. I said, well, I don't care if you like it or not. It's my house. And that's just, that's just kind of how things are going to roll. And so anyway, he took off and said he was going to walk back to Sonora. Um, well, it's, uh, I think 280 miles. I said, well, you know, you can walk about three miles an hour. How long do you think? How's your math? He could get there a couple of days. And anyway, he did take off. Um, the Linda says, you think you'll see him again? I said, I don't know, but I'm not going to put up with that nonsense. I just can't do it. Um, Anyway, he came back a few weeks later. I had to actually take him back up to do jail time. And Delinda taught him about doing checkbooks, saving money. I mean, she has just been, to me, she's been his salvation because I was done. I was just, I was so done. At one point, his mom told me, I told him, I told her I was done. And she said, well, if you don't love him, who will? And it annoyed me. But anyway, it ended up being true. And one other thing in that point was my youngest son, Jeff, um, uh, came to me one day and he said, dad, you know, my mom died, right? I said, well, she died of cancer. And she said, just think of this. He said, if mom had not died and you had to move down here, when Jason wanted to come out of drugs, where would he have gone? It's a hard thing to swallow, but it kind of, kind of makes sense that his belief is, and I'm not so sure he's not right, that she gave his life for him. Uh, that he, he would come back around. He's a great kid today. A kid, he's 46. Um, got a good family, employed, has done really well. Uh, I call him my miracle son. Uh, never, never thought we'd ever see that, but that's, uh, that's my miracle son. Um, now, I'm getting more of the meat of what I want to tell you. Um, Delinda started Jim Rolls about seven years ago. Um, I've only been involved in it in a couple of years. Uh, be quite truthful with you, I didn't like it. Um, I didn't like prophecy. Um, I felt like it had really hurt um, both Jennifer and I. And I just uh, had a really tough time with it. Um, like I told you three times, it's three different three different people. One of them was a, was a pastor that was coming through, and they stayed at our house, and they were sitting at our table. He looks at me, and he says, Wes, I'm telling you, this ain't a sickness unto death, but a sickness unto the glory of God. And 
Well, anyway, I had a tough time with it. I, I was pretty ornery with people when I, when she passed away and they'd come up and want to give me a word or tell me how they felt or how I felt. I, I was not kind a lot of times, which I'm not, I'm not proud of, but there was the, uh, the hurt I felt. Um, and I had a dream. This was in 2018. And I told Delinda about it. I never had put much stock in dreams or interpretations or anything else like that. But uh, she told me I'd need to go see Ken Hoffer. And so I did. And uh, part of that dream was I needed to start uh, seeking spiritual access and not just doing what my traditional way of doing things was and I needed to, to start seeking the Lord more and, um, and then I met up with Jim Gifford and oh man he, he's just a light bulb I mean this guy he's he's he was the one that I told you told me I had a had, had a father problem Dave he's told me more stuff that I mean it's just unbelievable and uh, what really I think broke the whole thing for me was uh, David Kingsley one morning at Genesis had me come up and him and uh, Cindy Shores were there and Herb, her husband, and Wesley, or Wesley, Cass, David started prophesying and a lot of you were there uh, about unlocking my heart. And uh, it really, really, really bore witness with me. And, you know, I was almost proud of people would be afraid to uh, prophesy to me or tell me something like that because, you know, I'd get in their face and this just, it just bore witness so much with me that it was, um, there was just no denying it. And then Cindy came up and said the same thing and said that uh, you've really got a, uh, you got quite a fortress built up in there. And I don't even know how people know this kind of stuff, but you know, David's going, he had a, I had a prophecy told over me one time years ago and he said, it changed my life. And I'm telling you, David prophesied over me and it changed my life. I mean, it's like, how can people know this stuff? I'm just so, kind of blown away, I guess, but uh, anyway, so Cindy wants to do this activation. Yeah, I didn't even know what an activation was. I never done no activations. Um, so anyway, she says, you got a key in your, in your hand. You want to give it to Jesus? I'm going, yeah, yeah, I'm game for that. Well, anyway, she says, well, just give it to Jesus. So I held my hand up and I actually went back and looked at the video of that after it was done to see if I opened my hand, if I actually let it go, because I wanted to know it was really gone. And that, that has been such a, such a life changing experience uh, for me. I had something written down here. I can't even read it because my eyes ain't working too good. Oh, that was the activation. Um, I really felt like when I went sat down, went and sat back down, uh, I was actually praying. I said, God, you know, I really feel like this is really real. And it was like in my mind, I could see stuff being thrown out of this room. You know, it was a three-walled room, and there wasn't a wasn't a wall on the other side, and stuff just thrown out, thrown out, and thrown out. And I was going, God, what does all this mean? You know, and it's like, He says, Well, what do you want to do with that room? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't want the same stuff back in there again because I've dealt with this for so long. I don't, I don't need this anymore. And so I sat there and I prayed for a while and finally, I don't know if God did it or if it just came to me or what, but it was like, I want, I want the fragrance of you and DL in that room. That's what I believe. I think that's what he did. Let's put that, put that fragrance in there. Um, anyway, it's been really cool. Um, I've got to tell you about, uh, before I tell you about, I'm going to tell you about my trip to the mountain too, but uh, CMA, Christian Motorcycle Association, has played a part in this whole thing. I, uh, I've ran men's groups for years, and I quit a men's group uh, six months before this next event happened, just feeling like the Lord had something different for me. And 
I'd started running around with some of the some of the guys in the Christian Motorcycle Association. And I never did consider myself an evangelist. I hate to admit this, but I was almost ashamed maybe to talk about Jesus to somebody. And this whole thing has just changed my life where I don't care if somebody likes me talking about Jesus to them or not. It just, what if it's going to hurt my feelings? You know, that obviously they're not going to kill you. And so it just doesn't matter. And so anyway, I got involved with this Christian Motorcycle Association and, uh, it was really funny. I joined and I was the newest member in the chapter. And, um, I was on my way to Montana, Gillette, Montana, no, Gillette, Wyoming, um, uh, to an, uh, event. They were, this Christian motorcycle station was doing out there. And, uh, Mike, uh, Sendaceros was with me. Anyway, I, we're, we're out in the middle of Wyoming and I have a headset on my, uh, on my helmet where I can get phone calls. And so Dan, uh, calls me up and he says, the president's resigned. I said, really? And, and I'd known Randy for a lot of years. And I says, well, that's kind of kind of sudden. And uh, anyway, he said, well, there's a meeting tonight. You know, would you stand for the president? I said, I'm the newest guy in the block. Why would they want me in there? And he says, well, he said, that's just, you know, and I said, well, you know what? If, if the Lord does that, then I'll just figure it was the Lord saying that's what he wanted me to do. And so uh, <laughs> Dan calls me back later. I think it was that evening. And he said, well, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you condolences or congratulations. And so anyway, so anyway, got into the Christian Motorcycle Association, became the president of the chapter now. And that's been a really, really, really good ride for me. It just, it's really down my alley. It's just uh, being able to minister to people. And it's just, uh, it's just been a really fun time. But I want to tell you about the trip to the mountain. Um, most of you know, or some of you know, I took a trip to the mountain. How much time do I have? Do you all my other time yet? <laughs> um, took a trip to, up to the mountain and it was really, really kind of neat that Linda and I had been talking about this for, for some time. And, um, I don't remember us talking to Mark or Mark was where we were talking or something. Anyway, Mark Maxwell has a motorhome. And I was trying to figure out where I would go and take my pickup and go camping. And I hate to camp anymore. I've done that my whole life. And, uh, but I wanted to be alone. I know I didn't want to be in a, uh, in a hotel, I needed to be where I could be alone. Uh, anyway, so Mark says, well, take my, take my motor home. And so I did, and then I got another friend, and he says, well, why don't you just go up to Nassau Meadow Ferguson campgrounds up there? So, uh, well, that's a good idea. So anyway, December the 16th, I headed up there. It was a Monday morning, um, just to spend time with the Lord. And one of the things Jim Gifford told me, he says at the top of the, he said, you're gonna wanna do some writing. And he says at the top of the page, right, Father, I've come here for no other purpose than to be with you. And it was, uh, I can't even tell you, it was Monday through Thursday that I stayed up there. And I don't, I don't think I've ever figured out how somebody could be a monk, but I think I could have been a monk. It was so neat just spending time with the Lord. There was nothing else. There was no cell reception. There was nothing. In fact, it was kind of funny. The first night, I didn't take much food because I really planned on fasting the time I was up there and it took me most of the day to be able to get my head where I felt like I could really you know, commune with God and uh, just there's so much stuff that you know, well, all of you have it I'm not the only one that has that there's just so much stuff that goes on in our head um, anyway, and it was kind of funny so I was, I was sitting there reading the Bible and I decided I wanted to read all of the red in the New Testament and so that's what what I had been doing, and I was probably seven o'clock at night. And, uh, I'm sitting there reading. And I felt like the father says, uh, "You having supper?" No, I was going to fast. And I felt like he says, "Well, did I tell you to do that?" No, it just seemed like the right thing to do. And he says, well, "Get up and make yourself something." Well, okay. And so I got up and made a little something, and it was funny because Deborah uh, Gifford had given me a loaned me a tape recorder with uh, some CDs. And so I had a little something to eat and sat down and started reading again. And I felt like he said, well, don't you like music? And he knows I do. A stupid question. And uh, he said, well, why don't you listen to music? And I, well, I thought I should be fast in that too. He said, did I tell you to do that? No. Uh, so anyway, I put on a, put on a CD and wow, what a, I did that for three days. It was such a, such a powerful time. 
uh, I was at, I'd go out walking every day. I'd walk for several miles a day and was out there and just praying in tongues. And I think, you know, God actually reactivated my prayer language. I mean, it was just really, it was just so wild. I mean, just so wild. Um, it was actually when I, when I got back home, I think Delinda was getting ready to send Mark up where I was because she, he knew where I'd gone to. And he said, man, have you heard from Wes yet? Is, is he coming back today? And, but it was just, uh, God is just so good to us. Um, for me, I just don't realize how much, uh, I think I've always had God in a little box where I just, uh, check, 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 instead of really trying to develop a, a relationship, um, uh, where it's, uh, more than just to sit down and, you know, ask for more things or more whatever, or just be able to try to try to communicate with God. Um, I guess the other thing is I have to tell you is I didn't realize how hurt I was. Uh, and God has just been healing that. I mean, it's just been, I feel like the portals of heaven have been opened. Uh, it's just really been good. Um, God wants to use us. He wants to use me. We just got to get us out of the way. For me, anyway, I got to get Wes out of the way. I've got to, he's got to, he's got to just declare that God's the one I'm following here. The rest of it doesn't matter anymore. It just doesn't matter. Um, feel like, uh, and as you know, going through this whole time we're going through, he ain't done. Yeah, it's time for us to stand up. You know, this is, I don't mean to be political, but I feel like all of my life, you've seen all this. They took prayer out of schools. They took this out. They took this. And we just kind of sat by and let it happen. And I had enough. It's enough. It's time to stand up. Stand up for, for God, for what is right, for his word. Uh, Philippians 2.10 used to be one of my favorite verses, and it is again now. Uh, it says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his suffering and become like him in his death. I used to love that when I was young and leading worship and really had a good relationship with Christ. I lost that. I lost that. That's where it's back to. That's where it's back to. I have to tell you one other thing. There's uh, I think the general saved my life spiritually. Um, I think I, I don't know if I ever apologized to Delinda for making, I used to make fun of her, you know, spiritual stuff. I'd make fun of her. I'm really ashamed of that, honey, and I'm sorry. God's been really good, really, really good. A um, couple of songs I'd like for you to look up. I didn't have them play them tonight because they're not, uh, they're not like, sing-along worship songs. Um, one of them Deborah Gifford gave to me when I went up on the mountain. It's uh, The name of it's My God and King, and it's by Terry McAlman, I think, A-L-M-O-N. I play that song every morning when I get up to do my devotions. It's the first, uh, first thing I do. And the other night, the Lord woke me up with a song. I was pretty sure it was a song. Woke, woke me up, and the only thing I could remember was Here He Comes. And uh, I actually got up and went and wrote it down so I wouldn't, I wouldn't forget it. And that's by Joseph uh, Habakai, H-A-B-E-D-A-N-Y. And that's, that's a song about here he comes. Here comes Jesus. He's coming. What are we going to do with him? What are we going to do? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to press in. I want to be that disciple. I want to be that, uh, what Ken was talking about earlier. I like that, Ken. That was good. At least that was one story you didn't tell it wasn't true. So, but anyway, thank you all very much. I love you guys. You guys have been such a blessing. Such a blessing. I mean, it's just, I could start naming names, but I'd probably forget somebody. But you guys just know I love you all. And I'm just, I am so grateful for you. Grateful for my wife. She stuck with me all this time until maybe God finally got a hold of me. All right. Thank you, Teresa. I'm done.
Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Wes. Reminds me of the scripture that uh, we'll overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And uh, testimonies are great because they they uh, encourage us of, of the goodness of God. And uh, regardless of what everybody's been through, stuff, everybody has a story. Yep. And, uh, uh, and they're all miraculous because God... God is so good to bring us uh, to himself. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that encouragement. And uh, thank you, Lord, for Wes and for Delinda. Okay. So uh, I really did, as I was praying about the meeting, I just felt that uh, Joseph came, came to mind to close us in prayer. So uh, if you can unmute Joseph and if you uh, would close us uh, there, Joseph, that'd be great. Thank you. Amen. Well, Heavenly Father, we, we just come before you right now. We just thank you for the testimony that we heard tonight. It brings hope into our lives, Lord, that you're always there to be with us. Father, um, we, we just, um, we just want to glorify you in all that we do, in everything that we have, in our hands, in our feet, and with our mouth. Lord, we just want to glorify you. Father, as we go throughout the rest of this week, be with us. Um, put a hedge of protection around us, Lord. And um, keep, keep us um, healthy. And, and um, Lord, we, we just know that you're, you're, you are coming soon, Lord. And, and we look forward to that time. And we just praise you, Lord, and we give you all the glory tonight. And we thank you. You're, you're graceful. You're full of grace and mercy, Lord. Amen. And, and I, amen. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Awesome. Amen. Thank you, Joseph. And thank you, Wes, for blessing you, us. And bless you all. And we say, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you.